Okay, so welcome everyone. We're here for uh, Ajit Gary's uh, colloquium, which we're very excited to have him here and to, uh, what was it, to lecture, on, lecture to us about uh, special relativity. I just wanted to give a few brief announcements that, first of all, um, we actually created a NYU Siam Instagram account and just feel free to uh, follow it and also just spread the word about our club. We're starting club, we want to get more members and hopefully we'll, uh, in the fall when we're all back, we'll get a huge uh, turnout. Um, also, I wanted to also we have a website which I left a link on our Instagram. So feel free to check out. It's obviously got the dates for ours. However, the um, the colloquium on the eighth will be rescheduled for one week later, which I posted on the Instagram report. This will get updated soon um, for the fifteenth at six p.m. Right? That's a, I think that's the yeah the right date. And um, of course, also feel free to check out our, um, our YouTube channel if you missed any of the lectures or just interested. We have um, all of them updated as of now. So uh, yeah, that's, that's all the things I want to update and just uh, look forward to hearing Ajit speak. So I'm going to hand it over to him. OK, wait, wait, wait. So the, the talk on the uh, it doesn't behind you. 8th has been moved to the 15th. Yeah, the one on the eighth is moved to the fifteenth. But the twenty second is staying in place. Yeah, the other one, yeah, the other one stayed stayed the same. Okay, thank you. Okay, so do you take it away? Great, thanks, Ryan. Um, yeah, so the uh, right, so the fifth seminar will be three weeks from now, and then the sixth one one week from then. So. Um, as uh, you guys might have noticed, um, the uh, notes have not been keeping up with my lecture. Um, they're somewhere, they're just not in the PDF. So um, so first of all, thanks uh, you guys for uh, following along this journey as I uh, simultaneously teach and create the seminar. Um, but my uh, hope is that um, three weeks from now, um, the notes will be in close to a final form. Um, so then for the last two seminars, uh, you know, everything should come together nicely. and. Uh, I can field some questions and we can talk about uh, cool things that come after special relativity. Um, so today uh, I wanted to start talking about paradoxes. So this is usually how um, physics classes open the class. They'll show you um, something that seems unintuitive um, and then they'll introduce some correction terms to make it make sense. Um, but I don't like that approach because it's just very like Newtonian, Newtonian minded. But we've known special relativity as a thing for over 100 years. So um, I wanted to teach the math of that as the standard of, uh, you know, high speed kinematics. Um, and then uh, my hope is that these, um, these paradoxes, I'll introduce them to you and then they'll dissolve right in front of your eyes. You might already, the way I word the question at this point, you might already like see why it's a bad question. So let's get into it. Um, I'll just share my desktop and then I can scroll over. Okay, can you guys see that? Okay, cool. So um, <clears throat> let's talk about the most famous um, special relativity paradox. It's called the barn ladder paradox. Okay, so, uh, well, so I've, first I should talk about um, <coughs> uh, time and uh, space contraction. So um, I don't like these terms. Um, so I've avoided using them so far, except uh, in passing. Um, but you, uh, you all have already seen uh, this effect. So um, our, we made an argument about how the Lorentz view should work. And our argument uh, went something like this. Um, along causality lines in the direction of motion, we're going to stretch those eigenvectors, so those like causality vectors, um, by a factor one plus nu, like one plus the speed of the, uh, to the observer that we're switching reference frames to. And along the perpendicular causality lines, we'll squish it. Um, the intuition being that uh, you can't chase causality and you can't run away from causality, or you can't chase light and you can't run away from light. So um, from our perspective, if we didn't do this squishing, moving observers would be chasing some light beams and running away from other light beams. And from their perspective, they'd be calculating the speed of light in front of them to be too slow and speed of light behind them to be too fast. Right? So like Einstein has this thought experiment of what happens if you're flying through space at the speed of light holding a mirror. Okay, well, Einstein later showed that you can't do that because you would turn into pure energy, but we'll talk about that later. Um, so let's say you're moving at 0.99999 the speed of light flying through space holding a mirror, right? So um, it, from a, a, stationary, a relatively stationary observer, um, it would look like they are uh, chasing the light beams coming off their face and they probably don't see themselves in the mirror because you know they're they're chasing these light beams. 
Um, but that's not what, but uh, we know from relativity, that's just not what happens. Um, everyone perceives light uh, moving the same speed. So we can, we can start at the postulates if you want, start at Einstein, Einstein's postulates that um, everyone's going to perceive light working the same way, no matter how fast you're going. Um, and then we conclude that uh, the person flying through space at 0.999, the speed of light, has to be able to see themselves in the mirror as if they weren't moving at all. Okay, well, how do we, how do we fix that in the math? Well, from a linear algebra perspective, um, we have the freedom to scale along these eigenvectors. Um, the, the parameterization of those causality lines is non-physical to us. Um, a photon, there's, there's no notion of squishing or stretching the world line of a photon. There's no ticks of a clock for the photon. So um, we're, gonna, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna leverage that uh, non-physical uh, parameterization of the causality lines and stretch in the direction that the relatively moving observer is moving and squish in the opposite direction. Um, and that way we've like adjusted. Okay, um, this introduces uh, a term that uh, one minus nu squared multiplied or square root of one minus nu squared multiplied to the whole thing. Um, well, one minus nu squared uh, applied to like the area elements. Um, so, okay, in our correction, we went and squished space. Uh, so that's no good um, because and, and, and I mean, there's maybe that, you know, we mentioned this before, but let me just justify it one more time. Why is squishing space bad? Um, there's some physical theories that are very, uh, uh, very deeply rooted in um, scale invariance, like, um, like cosmology stuff likes to talk about like, oh, well, you know, the universe like this, the universe like this, they seem, you know, like way different sizes, but the photons don't care about size. So, you know, really we're just talking about ratios. We don't care about absolute size. Um, we care about absolute size because the atomic properties of everything are based on how far apart they are. If it takes light longer to get between the lattice points of a certain object, it'll behave differently macroscopically. You know, does that object radiate? Does that object like microwave well? Like, you know, maybe you can put tinfoil in a microwave if you stretch space the wrong way. Okay, so we want physical properties to be the same. So um, we can't squish space relative to light. Um, so we uh, unsquish it <laughs> with the Lorentz factor. Um, and then we get the whole, uh, we got the whole um, Lorentz boost matrix. Um, and in the Eigen basis, the Lorentz boost matrix is very simple. Um, it's one plus V one minus V on the diagonal and zeros on the off diagonal. Um, and then multiply the Lorentz term to the whole thing. And then we type the Lorentz term here. So Lorentz factor equal to, uh, well, I guess uh, defined as uh, gamma is how physicists like to write it. And it's this fraction, one minus nu squared. Okay, so um, one or two uh, seminars ago, <coughs> we justified where that term comes from. Um, and now we're gonna look into its implications. Uh, so um, we can, we'll do careful uh, linear algebra motivated examples um, later, um, but maybe it's already uh, obvious to you that um, this, uh, this correction term is going to uh, cause some, uh, some squishing. Um, well, the, the previous reasoning was to unsquish things. Um, but when you're talking about observers, uh, that's way bigger than this like material uh, reasoning. So, I mean, that was justification for it. But from the scale of, um, of the moving observers, the form that this correction term is going to take is a squishing of space or a squishing of time. Um, Maybe I didn't explain that very well. So let's see. Uh, yeah, okay. So da, da, da. actually, yeah, I'll, I'll do the careful linear algebra uh, setup later. Um, but yeah, okay. So, uh, right, we've seen this with the ticks of the clock. Um, the ticks of the clock spacing out differently when you're moving. So when you're moving faster, the space of the clock from the stationary observer's perspective anyway, um, get more spaced out. The ticks along the moving observer's clock get stretched out. And the um, and then uh, the space, uh, it was a little confusing for us to think about, but the space dots um, also got stretched out. Um, so these inter constant intervals getting farther apart uh, is akin to space uh, contracting and time dilating from our perspective. So, I mean, what does that mean? Um, the way physicists like to say it is, oh, for a moving observer, their clock ticks slower than ours. And for a moving observer, space is squished relative to our space. They feel like everything's fine, but when we look at them, they're too small. And when we look at them, their clock is ticking slower. 
this, I mean, this is because we insist on, on, you know, things making sense in Newtonian way. We say like, oh, well, my clock ticks like this and time is universal, like father time, tick, 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 the clock of the universe, like Newton thought. So by that notion, their clock is ticking slower. But if they don't perceive their clock ticking slower, I don't think it's a very good way to describe the system at all. Okay, so, um, but this is how physicists like to do it. They like to say that, okay, so let's add this correction term. Let's, um, so for a moving object, like, you know, uh, for, for low speed things like an airplane, it'd be like a third order correction or something that it's completely negligible. Um, let's add this correction term about how um, time slows down for that moving observer relative to us and how space contracts for that moving observer. Uh, and in fact, that contraction term for both is the Lorentz factor uh, and it cancels out. So um, the uh, space contracts for them and time slows down for them. Uh, so everything works out just fine. Okay, so uh, those two things cancel out, uh, X over T velocity. Um, all right, so uh, that's, okay. So to recap where we are with the Lorentz factor, um, me and, a moving, and a, another observer moving relative to me with some velocity mu. From my perspective, um, time is ticking slower for them. How much slower? Multiplied by the Lorentz factor. V is always between zero and one. So V squared is always between zero and one. V nu, whatever. Um, so one minus nu is always between zero and one. So square root of that is always between zero and one. So one over that is always some number greater than one. Um, so, uh, right, so you can think of the spacing of their time clock getting stretched out where you could take the inverse of the Lorentz factor to multiply by uh, their time. Okay, I mean, you, you understand how greater than and less than one works to use the Lorentz factor appropriately. Okay, cool. Um, it gets a little confusing sometimes actually. Um, but, <laughs> but anyway, so I see their clock ticking too slow and I see space contracting for them. But you divide those two things and the Lorentz factor cancels out and I see their velocity, uh, that's some velocity v. From their perspective, they can think of themselves as stationary and me is moving as a velocity v. And the same thing happens. They see my time slowed down and my, and my space uh, contracted, but the Lorentz factors cancel out and they also calculate that I'm moving at v relative to them. Okay, uh, questions on Lorentz factor motivation or the idea of space and time contraction? You don't have to like time contraction. Right? Know how to rotate here because the game is very different. So what, one question nice. is yeah. the the parameter new mm. is that uh, physically is that the, the ratio of my speed over the speed of light or causality? Oh yeah 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 uh, fantastic question right I uh, right I should have said that explicitly there for sure um, yeah new is um, yeah that your yeah. fraction speed of light right, because be uh, the physicists um, all, uh, often have the C uh, propagating through here. So then astrophysicists just set speed of light equal to one and make the units work to make that happen. So they just like take it out. So I've always been taking it out. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, uh, right, yeah. So if your velocity is zero, then this is just one over one. Lorentz factor is nothing. It, so that's this low speed limit of special relativity. It turns back into Newtonian mechanics. There's no space contraction or time dilation. Uh, and when V is one, you divide by zero and everything explodes. Um, time gets dilated down infinitely small and space gets contracted infinitely long. And so for a photon, it sees all of time in an instant and all of space, um, oh, and its existence and its physical existence stretched out to all of space. Um, it exists at everywhere in its history at the same time. I mean, that's, I mean, you don't have to think of it like that. That's, that's, that's applying time to the edge case where it broke down. That's like an anthropic thing, right? Like, you know, it's only amazing because humans can't like understand that, <laughs> but um, photons don't care. They, they're just there. Um, okay, so if you're going 0.9999 in the speed of light, then yeah, you're going, you um, are going to be stretched out fr from someone else's perspective. You're gonna be stretched out over a huge amount of space and your clock is gonna be ticking so slow. Um, okay. So, uh, right, so, so a, a quick note on um, when people say that we'll never get to uh, another galaxy or whatever, um, I'm, not so, I'm not so sure because um, this is gonna sound ridiculous, but when you can, if you can harness insane amounts of energy by like using a Dyson sphere around the sun or we figure out how antimatter works or something, uh, or, anti, or we figure out how to harvest energy from antimatter or something like that, um, and you put a giant booster on the entire earth and accelerate the entire thing to 0.999 C, 0.999 the speed of light, then uh, relative to like the stationary moon or whatever, just pick something stationary in our solar system. Relative to our solar system, 
time on earth will be ticking insanely slow. So you could take the entire human race and, and you know, just super time dilate us and then send us off in any direction. And you can make us go arbitrarily fast, um, which would make us, uh, or sorry, arbitrarily close to the speed of light, which would make time dilate down arbitrarily slow for us, which means we could get arbitrarily far in a finite amount of time. This is something weird. Even though the speed of light is bounded, when you go faster, time slows down for you. So you can actually travel, I have to be very careful the way I say this, you can travel an unbounded distance in a finite time. You can effectively travel faster than the speed of light. Just the thing is that when you're moving the speed of light, this weird like cheating trick happens. When you're moving the speed of light or when you're moving something comparable to the speed of light or, or any speed really, but let's say 0.9C just so we can conceptualize it. Um, you're moving 0.9C, time slows down and space contracts and those two things cancel out so that you never feel like you're moving faster than the speed of light. But it's you could definitely tell that you are because let's say you start at one end of the galaxy stationary, okay? Let's say the galaxy is the reference point, okay? So, refer, so, relative, so when I say your velocity, I always mean relative to like the supermassive black hole at the center or something. So you start off stationary, you know, not, not moving um, at one end of our galaxy. And then you accelerate super fast to 0.999C, right? It doesn't take, it doesn't matter how long you take to accelerate to that, whatever. So um, you accelerate um, and now you're moving 0.999C. And from your perspective, you can always consider yourself stationary, which means the Milky Way galaxy is moving at 0.999C relative to you, which means it will be space contracted down by a huge factor. I mean, plug in 0.999 into this. So it contract, it's contracted down to a huge factor. So you look out the window of your spaceship and you're like, what happened to the Milky Way? It's, it's super small now, um, but you, but so, and your clock, you always feel like is ticking normally. Um, but uh, yeah, right. So you feel like you're moving, or you feel like the Milky Way galaxy is moving at 0.999C under you. Uh, and it's very small now, um, but there's no, you're not going faster than the speed of light. But if you, if you like meditate on it for a second, you're like, hold on, hold on. I know how big the Milky Way galaxy is at rest. And like, if I use like the stars in it as reference points, I'm effectively moving way faster than the speed of light right now. It's just, it's physics played this trick on us and space is smaller right now. Like it's, it, it makes, it makes you wonder like whether the way we've ever described this made any sense, like at all, like clearly you can travel, you can effectively travel faster than the speed of light. Oh, and by the way, when you slow down, everything will look normal again. And then you'll be like, oh, wow, look, I traveled the entire diameter of the Milky Way in like a day, which a priori seems like I travel faster than the speed of light. But technically, I was never traveling faster than the speed of light by my point of view. It makes you wonder why physics even, making me wonder why physics even describe it this way, because I feel like it's misleading. It's misleading to say that there's a speed limit. To, it's misleading to say there's a speed limit to the universe. There's, we perceive a speed limit to the universe because back when we thought that the universe was simple, it was just like earth and stuff. We defined space, we defined time. These things seem like reasonable concepts. They were the same everywhere on earth, right? They could even govern the heavens or whatever, as Newton put it. They could even govern like celestial bodies, um, just space and time, you know, flat, uh, flat in geometric sense. Um, then, uh, and then velocity is a ratio of space and time. But then when we look deeper, we find that you know space isn't very good because you don't have like simultaneity and time isn't very good because it behaves differently depending on how fast you're moving. Um, and then velocity, this ratio um, has this weird property that it bunches up towards the speed of light as a number, right? But just as a number. Okay, so how do we feel on that? Um, you, contrary to, to pop, what pop science would surface level tell you, you can effectively travel faster than the speed of light. You can cover more distance than you would think you could. Cool. Uh, so let me make sure I understand right. Mm -hmm. But you, if, if I understand right, you're 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 kind of describing basically what like in in the movie Interstellar, yeah. where you can you can travel galaxies away, and for you, seconds or minutes may have gone by. And for for my poor grandmother who stayed back on Earth, it's been a hundred million years since I left, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
Great. All right, cool. Uh, yeah, also in interstellar, when they get into a deep gravitational yeah, field, like, um, uh, time slows closing. down also. Uh, why is this? Well, uh, this is general relativity it, now, but the, uh, but it turns out closer. that free and falling in a gravitational field is indistinguishable from uh, moving very fast. Ooh, why is that? That's weird. Okay, that's something we'll get to uh, at the, we could talk, were you saying something? I keep like you're muted. Okay, yeah. The um, we'll we'll get into GR at the at the end of the uh the sixth seminar, um, or the sixth uh, session. Yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah, Einstein's equivalence principle about a different way to think about gravity is is pretty interesting. But we have to we have to get a grounding on special relativity first. Okay. So uh, great. Um, so let's talk about the barn ladder paradox. <laughs> um. Okay. So um, you have a farmer and his son. They're chilling. Um, the farmer reads this uh, Scientific American uh, article saying like, oh, when you move at relativistic speeds, uh, space contracts. Um, so he's like, oh, that's interesting. Um, I have this barn, it's, it's, a, it's a 10 foot barn and I have an 11 foot ladder and I just can't fit it in there. Um, so uh, what if I have my son run uh, at uh, you know, relativistic speeds holding the ladder, um, you know, run at the barn at relativistic speed uh, holding the ladder and the ladder will uh, contract down and then it will fit in the barn. Uh, you know, I can shut the barn doors and uh, the ladder's in there, right? Um, as soon as he slows down, you're going to have a problem. But for, for a split second, I could fit the ladder in there, right? Okay, cool. So uh, the son, uh, dubious, um, not at being able to run relativistic speeds, you know, he can accomplish that. Um, but uh, dubious, um, you know, because it seems too, too good to be true. Uh, he reads the article too. It says, hey, dad, so um, by relativity, that means that I could th I consider myself stationary and the barn is flying at me at 0.9 C, which means the barn would be length contracted down to like nine feet or something. And then the ladder definitely wouldn't fit in the barn. So, so I, like, and you know, all the, the viewpoint from both reference frames should be equally valid. So I don't see how, how either of us could be right. Like how could, well, I, okay, that's, that's too much insight for the sun. Let's, let's assume the sun uh, is, is self-centered, right? The sun says, no, there's no way, there's no way the ladder will fit in the barn. From my perspective, the ladder will always be bigger than the barn. From the farmer's perspective, the barn will always be bigger than the ladder. So they devise a test um, where the farmer sets up like the two doors to uh, close via remote control. So, um, you know, he has, a, he, has a, uh, he has a remote control for it and the doors will shut. So he says, all right, son, you run at that barn and when, and I know I'm gonna see that ladder stuck inside the barn at one point, it's gonna be fully enclosed. I'm gonna prove it to you because I'm gonna close the doors at the same time. The doors will close simultaneously. Um, and then they'll open back up before you run into the wall and, you know, break physics. Um, and uh, yeah, so, and, and that'll show you, you'll be trapped inside that barn for a split second. And I'll take a picture when I see you inside that barn. Um, and that will settle it. And the son says like, all right, sure, let's, let's, let's try it. So, um, cool. Uh, preliminary thoughts or, or predictions? Uh, so the, the, like that, like he's clearly way better. The father's sitting outside. He's stationary. Um, yeah, he, he knew, the barn well, is well, I mean, uh, uh, I Relative to the yes, earth. Yes, <laughs> yes, right, the far, right, yes, yeah, yeah. Relative to the earth. Um, and and the farmer, or sorry, yeah, the farmer, like the father, uh, is stationary relative to the barn also. Bar, nice. Barn, earth, farmer, sister. Right. Yeah, so, so first of all. I'm trying to convince myself that the the two predictions are are the right predictions. Um, that from the from the father's perspective, the sun and the ladder should contract. But the the son's perspective, um, the uh be because from the sun's perspective the earth and the barn are coming towards him at point nine c mm -hmm. therefore the barn should contract yeah okay <laughs> all right what's that um oh that's nice but you. then should they also disagree on right, when the sun is in the, the barn physical. because uh, 
Oh man. Sorry. Okay. Uh, from the from the father's perspective, the sun is getting smaller, the ladder's getting smaller, the barn stays the same size. Um, so the sun is also moving more slowly. Um, the sun will be moving at say point nine C. Right, but, the, but what, what that means, like the amount of time it takes for him to make it to the the number of seconds that that the okay, father will count mm -hmm. um, nice. by the exactly time the sun it. enters the bar will be, the ball in the be, will be fewer <laughs> sec more seconds oh, than what nice. the sun counts. Uh, fewer one of those two yeah yeah okay before both of our brains melt uh you are <laughs> was, was absolutely nice. on the right track so uh let's let's uh let's get to the punchline then yeah that's that's um, exactly what I'm we're looking for them measuring time differently is going to be a problem um more specifically i guess it's the uh, that simultaneity uh isn't agreed upon okay why is simultaneity agreed upon well because they're using different clocks um not really because they're using different clocks but because they're uh, positing that you can draw these simultaneity lines. We, we, spent, we spent a while talking about why simultaneity shouldn't be a thing. Here's what happens when you insist simultaneity is a thing, okay? Um, and furthermore, you insist that simultaneity is, uh, like the line of simultaneity is perpendicular to like your velocity. So, um, so a moving observer, they uh, perpendicular in the Lorentz sense, so, or in the Minkowski metric sense. So, um, I'll show you, I'll show you. Okay, so uh, here, this is the farmer's perspective, you and the father's perspective. Here's a barn, red barn. It's, um, so, uh, oh, I can move my simultaneity line up and down, I think. Aha, cool. So here's a simultaneity line. Um, so, and, and we definitely need simultaneity lines because the farmer said, I'm going to close those doors simultaneously. Um, the doors aren't even necessary for the thought experiment. Um, another way of saying it is, I think the entire ladder is going to be in the barn at one point in time, which means I believe that the left end of the barn or the left end of the ladder will be in the barn simultaneously with the right end of the ladder being in the barn. Or another way of saying it, I think that the right, the left end of the ladder will enter the barn before the right end of the ladder leaves the barn. There's some moment where they overlap. Some sim so that's a simultaneous statement. It's a statement that posits that you can look to the left and look to the right and say all of this is happening right now, right? Which which we 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 tried to throw out, right? Well, here, here's here's what happens when you don't throw it out. Okay, so um, right. So if you want to see what an object looks like. Um, at any point, so uh, this is space and this is time, then you can use the simultaneity line. So you see at this slice of time, uh, this is the barn existing. So this is the width of the barn at rest. Um, uh, by the way, um, objects, since they change their, um, their length when they're moving relative to us, we have a term called proper length, which is the length as measured by that object. So, um, or in other words, when that object is at rest, how long is it? So if I say the length of the barn, I mean the proper length of the barn. Um, okay, so here's the barn uh, and here's the ladder. And this is not the proper length of the ladder. This is the length contracted length of the ladder because um, it's moving. So, uh, okay. So uh, here's a causality cone for us, um, just for fun. And then um, here's the barn, it's stationary. So it goes up, it goes uh, up the whole time. Um, so not moving in space, uh, but moving, but yes, moving through time. While the ladder here is moving through space and time and not quite at the slope of, of the causality line because that would be impossible, but at point nine C, I think it actually, yeah, uh, point nine. Okay, at point nine C. Okay, cool. So um, here's the ladder at this instant and Here's the ladder at a later instant. Okay, so this is a farmer's perspective. The sun's running towards the barn. Um, here we see this is when the, the front end of the ladder is just now uh, entering the barn. And front end of the ladder is in the barn, but the back end of it is still sitting outside the barn. So here's the back end of the ladder still sitting outside the barn and the front end is inside the barn now. So we're moving, we're moving. And bam, at this point, the entire ladder is inside the barn. You can see it here, there's some barn here and then there, oh, there's some barn and then there's ladder and then there's more barn. Ladder's inside the barn and the farmer says, that's my cue. And, uh, and these are the two doors shutting. So I represented the door shutting by the doors appearing. So here the door appears, it's, it's popped into existence. 
it exists for a while, the doors exist for a while. Uh, and then when he closes the doors, they disappear from view and they pop out of existence. Um, the barn, the ladder is still fully inside the barn, has a little extra buffer there. The farmer is very fast on the trigger finger um, and ladders leave in the barn and ladders out of there. Great. So farmer says, great, I won. This instant right here, I can move my simultaneity line down to it. That, that is my proof. Okay, let's move to the sun. So um, I could click this button for ladder, which will switch you to the reference frame of the sun, but I rather um, slide this slider that will continuously change us from a reference frame that is moving zero, at zero speed relative to this one to one that is moving 0.9 C relative to this one. So as I slide this slider, we are, um, what we're doing is, uh, it's, it's as if you were accelerating from zero to 0.9 C. This is how you would see the system change as you're accelerating. Okay. It's a weird statement that I said. This is how you see the system change as you're accelerating while always believing that you are stationary. <laughs> um, okay. okay, so, um, okay, uh, what the hell happened here? Okay, uh, let's, let's get into it. So let's use our simultaneity line to guide our intuition. So this is the sun's perspective. The sun sees, uh, here's the barn. The barn is tiny. The, maybe maybe I can track this too dramatically. Jeez. Okay. Um, here, here's the barn. The, the barn is um, the barn is tiny. Okay. The barn got shrunk, uh, shrunken by um, by space contraction. Okay. Um, but the ladder is uh, this this is approaching the ladder's normal size. Um, the ladder may look to you similar to the size the barn was. Well, that's because the proper length of the ladder and the proper length of the barn are about the same. Anyway, the idea was to run fast to make the ladder shrink so it fits inside or conversely to, to make the barn shrink so the ladder won't fit inside, okay? Depending on who you think is right. So, um, all right, so now the sun, uh, he's stationary holding this ladder and the barn is flying at him, okay? Doors open, barn flying at him. Um, so what we see here is after we did the shift, the door closing happens first. This door, ha this uh, back or front door of the, uh, back door, back door of the barn closes um before the barn even gets to you it's like it's like um some like sort of like moving car wash or something you're stationary and this open barn comes and passes over you the door opens or the door closes and then opens again before the barn even gets to you now the barn starts to pass over the farmer but it never totally encompasses him like the there's ladder here and there's ladder sorry the sun there's ladder here and there's ladder here and the barn is just over one tiny little portion of the ladder then the barn slides past you. Um, and then after the barn has, you know, the ladder's out of the barn, or at least the, the front end or the back end of it is, the front door will close. And then the front door will open. And the son says, wow, that was, that was uneventful. The farmer must have screwed up their timing. Or the farmer, or, because the, uh, the barn was coming at me and the back door closed and opened and then it passed over me. And then the front door closed and opened. What, that, that's, I'm, I'm definitely right here. Like, let alone the doors being off, the, the ladder was always completely long, or definitely longer than the barn. The barn never enclosed the ladder. So the answer would be that the way to resolve the paradox is that they're both right, which makes sense. Like, the, you know, um, uh, as Einstein said, the uh, physics is uh, indifferent to reference frames. Um, but the reason that they're, they're both right is that simultaneity is up to reference frame. It's fake. Um, simultaneity is not real. The, uh, the farmer can say, oh yeah, so, um, so actually here, this blue line here is the farmer's simultaneity line. So here you can see it shifting. So here's the, here's the, the father's simultaneity line and the simultaneity line, uh, we see it shifting as uh, the farmer becomes the one that's moving. So at, the so at this point here, the sun is just, you know, the, the barn is like straddling the ladder, but it doesn't enclose it. But if we look at the farmer simultaneity line, the farmer is going to be hard to think about. But the farmer simultaneity line sees this very large, long barn elements with closed doors on both ends and a ladder inside of it. So here, if we we can actually plot both viewpoints on the same graph, if we uh, consider that the farmer simultaneity line will be tilted compared to the sun's uh, simultaneity line. So. The farmer says, yes, the ladder was inside the barn at, at that moment. The son says, no, the ladder was not ever fully inside the barn. Both statements are meaningless because there's no such thing as simultaneity. <laughs>
Okay, question. Okay. So Take that slider, up, the, the velocity or the, the new slider, I guess. Knock it down to. Um, no, no, the top one. That's how fast okay. is the sun going? Knock it down to like 0. 0.6, 0. 0. 0.7 ish. There. Here, we have the the ladder is overlapping a little bit with both the uh, both doors at different yeah. points of the sun's perspective. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about what? What can you talk about <laughs> about yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, I think I think I think I can. Okay, so um, so first thing that's, that's very apparent in this uh, in this regime um, is that the door is this is slanted now. So we talked about this uh, uh, before how these um, these rectangles or causal diamonds or however you want to think about it um, get oblique, turn oblique. Um, so our door like spatially pops, it, like phases into existence. Uh, and then phases out of existence. Um, so uh, I, I drew the door with some width, and it turns out that the front end of that width is going to come down before the back end of it. I could have drawn it as just a stick, but I kind of like seeing this because you, you don't see the slant on these solid objects. So these, these solid objects, you can think of them as stacked lines. Maybe, maybe I should have added texture to these things. Oh, you know what I should add to this model is I should add a time ticking to these objects so that you can see that they're oblique also. Um, but anyway, so um, you can kind of see they're oblique if you look at the, the edges of the domain. Okay, so um, right, so at this moment, let's see, this, the uh, whose perspective is this? Okay, this is someone who's moving at, you know, half the speed of the sun, so uh, not quite either person's perspective. Um, what they see, uh, where's their simultaneity line? Um, this is always the farmer's simultaneity line. Oh, this is this is always your simultaneity line, right? So if this is how fast you're going, this is your simultaneity line. So at this moment, you see the ladder is still too big for the barn. Maybe we can move down to a point where where that's not the case. Uh, here we see the ladder is inside the barn, um, and we see the doors closed. Let me go to like right at the edge case, I guess. Yeah. So um, so here's the thing, right? So yes, there is an edge case where there is an edge case uh, where the ladder and the barn are the exact same size and the doors like close right on the edges of the ladder. Um, but it's actually not that much more interesting than or not, than the uh, the sun than the the farmer's perspective, um, where the ladder is in total totally encompassed in the barn. So um, so okay, so I think what you might have been getting at and uh, right, so so right, so we have these two perspectives that seem to that don't conflict physically because simultaneity is not a physical statement, but they do conflict intuition wise. So, so you were get, trying to drag me to a point where uh, the intuition would have to be reconciled. So we can smoothly vary the physics. Can we smoothly vary the intuition? Okay, so um, let's do this. How about when, uh, when the farmer sees the two doors close and the ladder inside of it, the doors explode, <laughs> um, something physical happens. So the farmer will only detonate the doors if they see the two ladders uh, or the ladder inside the two doors um, or something like that. Um, something that like would, would try to force simultaneity into the physics. Um, so when a simultaneous, so like if then, if the simultaneity event happens or if this simultaneous event happens, then an explosion happens, okay. Um, the issue then would be that, uh, the um, the information from the front door to the back door still takes time to travel, and that time is not negligible compared to the speed of the sun. Uh, nothing. So actually, let's let's do the other direction. Let's have it from the sun's perspective. Let's say the sun, uh, if the ladder is completely inside the barn from the sun's perspective, um, then. Uh, the ladder will explode. But actually, that, that's not supposed to ever happen. Hold on, hold up. You know what, let me get back to that. Let me, let me answer your question. Um, let's, let's talk about this. Okay, I am moving at some speed in between the sun and the farmer. Uh, I see the barn and the ladder moving towards each other. Um, the door closes. Uh, and then right here, the door closes on, you know what, actually, Actually, no, you were right. I put doing this at point six is a good jumping point for the next thing I want to explain. This is good. Um, so uh, right here, 
the door is closed to the to the barn and the ladder is partly outside of it. We see the ladder is sticking outside the barn here, but the barn door is closed. That's an issue. That's a physical issue that we have to deal with. Okay. And then over here, it happens too. The ladder is inside the barn, but the door is, in, is partly inside and partly outside the barn and the door is closed. That's something we can't possibly disagree about because the, the door and the ladder, one of them is gonna break or something. Something physical has to happen here. Um, well, the, uh, the reason that, uh, okay, so right. So why, okay, so what's wrong here? Okay, so what's wrong here is that, um, Right, so this is definitely a problem when you look at it like this. When you look at it like this, there's some physical problem. But the thing is, this model existing in this frame that you see it right here is posited on the farmer being able to close the doors at the same time instantaneously. Um, the farmer can't actually do that. The farmer has to do a series of events. The farmer has to see the ladder inside um, and then it may be the farmer sitting on top of the barn, so there's no time for the light for the signal to travel to the barn or whatever. Um, but then the farmer has to uh, da, 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 da. hold on. Wow. So clever, special relativity. Never mind. Special relativity has outsmarted me again. Would you look at that? There's a there's a triple point here. These three things all intersect at this point. So it's still not a problem. All right. Anyway, so um, there's some intermediate point where the ladder is the exact same size as the barn. Okay. Cool. Um, and at that point. That's just another perspective. If you try to force something to happen when someone perceives a simultaneity event, that thing, that physical thing that you want to happen will always be bound by the fact that the information has to travel from the front of the barn to the back of the barn. So let me explain it like this. So how would you ever know that the ladder is totally inside the barn or the barn is, is totally inside the ladder or whatever. How would you ever say, or, or they're, they coincide like this? How would, you ever, how would you ever say that, right? No matter what observer you are. To say that, you'd have to take a measurement at the left end and a measurement at the right end. Um, but like we talked about with our space, like our causality rulers, um, it takes time to lay down that ruler. Even if that ruler is a laser, the fastest that you could make the measurement is the speed of light. It's gonna take time to get from this end to this end with your measurement. So you can imagine that the ladder has a timer on it that, that um, yeah, you can imagine the ladder has a timer on it that um, when the front end passes through the door of the barn, it'll send a signal down to the back end of the ladder. Uh, and then when it gets to the back end of the ladder, if the back end is still inside the barn, the whole, the ladder explodes. Um, and when you say it like that, hopefully it's clear that information takes time to propagate uh, and your notion of simultaneity is poorly founded. Mm. Okay, so let's back up. You asked me to look at the 0.6 case. Uh, so what happens when you smoothly vary between these is there's an intermediate case where the ladder and the barn are both contracted to the exact same length. Um, that doesn't feel like it makes sense. Oh, the ladder's contracted more than the barn is. Okay. The ladder's contracted more um, because it's moving faster and they're the exact same length. Uh, and that's like a third perspective. Maybe like, you know, the farmer's daughter says, um, oh, actually, if I run next to next to them at, you know, 0. 0.60, then uh, I'll see them be the exact same size and it'll, and the doors will like close like, you know, tangent to the, to the ladder. So there's are three perspectives. Um, and they're all predicated on being able to know that the left end of the ladder and the right end of the ladder are at a certain position at, at a certain time. But if you measure one, it's gonna take you time to measure the other. Uh, and then saying that, insisting that those two things happened at one time slice is uh, you know, trying to use this notion of simultaneity that leads to this issue. So the argument can go like this. If say simultaneity, is a real thing, a physical thing, 
then these three different observers, 0 0.6, 0, and 0 0.9, are all going to say different things. Uh, therefore, contradiction because physics has to be the same in all the reference frames. So, therefore, you know, simultaneity is not a physical thing. You can talk about simultaneity all you want. It's just you're doing philosophy, not not physics. Okay, uh, how do we feel? It makes sense, but it's just so hard to come up with a new intuition. Do you know what I mean? I do, I do, um, especially because um, none of us have ever moved more than you know 700 miles per hour. Uh, so the, uh, yeah, um, I mean, even if you think about how you're moving at 25,000 miles per hour when you're on the equator, okay, maybe in New York, we're moving at like 18,000 miles per hour or something around the earth relative to like the moon or something, right? When the moon's rising, you can think of yourself as stationary and the moon is moving at 18,000 miles per hour. That's still so tiny compared to the speed of light that like, I don't, I don't think with a telescope you could even measure. No, you definitely can't. That's why astrophysicists wait for eclipses and stuff. You can't even measure the relativistic effect of the squishing of the moon with a telescope from your backyard. Like, I, like you, there's, you, there's hardly anything in your day-to-day -day life where you're gonna see this relativistic effect happening. Um, so yeah, it's very hard to get intuition around, but that's why, uh, and, and it's something I, I need to finish making in this next three weeks, um, or I guess four weeks, strictly speaking. The, um, the, uh, I, I teased it a little bit at the beginning, and so at the beginning of the notes, um, this VR simulation I'm trying to make, um, that I call Observer, it's um, so it's special activity and virtual reality. And the idea is I'll post a video of it in case you don't have a headset. The, um, the idea is that you run around and you control your velocity and you see everything shrinking around you. Um, and you can be the sun or the farmer in the barn ladder paradox. Um, I, I, the best case scenario is I can make a full like interactive sandbox. Um, the bare minimum that I'll accept for myself is to make the barn ladder paradox at least so you can live it for yourself. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'm hoping that will make it intuitive. Um, and then my long, long-term hobby goals are to make like some sort of like little space shooter where um, 3D like VR space shooter where relative physical effects happen. Um, because I'm thinking that from a from a you know a, a player point of view, that's a totally new mechanic that no game producer is going to create because it takes too much physics to understand. But um, but would be very interesting. So it's so it, I think it would make a genuinely interesting video game. Um, but then from a physicist perspective, it would give you this tool in like a gamified way to go explore these relativistic effects um, in a way that you're never going to find just by like you know making these stupid mathematical models or writing down the Lorentz factor on a piece of paper. Um, so I'm hoping physicists and and gamers alike it'll uh, it'll offer some insight. But um, the thing I've made so far is far from that. So we'll see. But <laughs> Okay, cool. Uh, we did the barn ladder paradox. Okay, um, great. Let's talk about the twin paradox. So uh, next paradox. So the next paradox is the, one, three. Ugh, this notebook is a mess. Okay, twin paradox. Okay, so uh, what's the twin paradox? So um, none of these are actually paradoxes, of course. No paradox is a real paradox. Well, I mean, some of them are. The Bonacharsky paradox is a real one. That one sucks. Okay, anyway. Um, so this is a fake paradox. Uh, it, it sounds bad, but it's not. Um, so, <coughs> excuse me. So you have uh, two twins. That's why it's called the twin paradox. Um, Twin one is standing on Earth, and twin two goes on a space adventure. So twin two flies off the Earth, then flies to Mars, and then flies back. So um, let's say twin two accelerates and decelerates very quickly. Or, you know, very quickly they can accelerate and decelerate arbitrarily quickly. You know, for whatever your means are. Um, and we'll revisit that that later, just in um, just in case that's uh, you don't want to accept that they can accelerate arbitrarily fast. Uh, like if you think that might be the trick or something, um, we will tackle that later. Um, but uh, right, so twin two uh, accelerates very fast to like 0.9 C and they fly to Mars um, and then they turn around. Uh, so they accelerate very quickly, they turn around and now they're flying a 0.9 C back to the earth and then they turn their boosters on and slow down and land on the earth. Okay, so, um, from, so the question is uh, who aged more? So from twin one's perspective, twin two was always moving up 0.9 C. Um, so their clock was always 0.9 C or negative 0.9 C, whatever. It's just the magnitude of the velocity that matters. 
So they, um, so twin, so in twin one's perspective, twin two was always moving at a, a high fraction of the speed of light. Um, so their clock was ticking quite slow. So when they get back, um, twin two should be younger than twin one. But from twins two, tw twin two's perspective, twin two can uh, just say, oh, I was the stationary one the whole time. You and the entire earth flew away, uh, or, or I don't know. Yeah, you and the entire earth fell out from beneath my feet and, and flew away and Mars came and hit me and then it all moved back. And all of you guys were moving up 0.9 C and you were aging slower, um, which means I'm, uh, I'm younger now, or sorry, I'm older now. So both twins are trying to say I'm older now but you know you can compare them, and one will be older. So, um, or, or 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 maybe not. With the bar and ladder paradox, it the, it fell apart, and uh, and neither person was really right. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Thoughts. Mutual time dilation. Who's right? Does it have to do with the fact that one of them is not in an inertial frame? Yeah, yeah, that was a very physicsy way to say it. Uh, congrats. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. So, an inertial frame of reference is one that's moving at a constant velocity to whatever you're referencing. So, an inertial reference. So, people, myself included, do this all the time. Where we say velocity and we mean relative velocity. No one has ever meant absolute velocity, and if they did, they were wrong. There's no absolute velocity. There's only relative velocity. Okay. So, whenever I say velocity, I mean relative velocity relative to something. And if you don't know what is relative to, then ask me because I, I probably should have mentioned it anyway. So, okay. So um, when someone says an inertial reference frame, that means a reference frame moving at a constant velocity. That's what the physics textbooks will tell you. But what does that mean? It means a constant velocity to the measurer, right? So an inertial reference frame can't just exist in a vacuum. It's always relative to something. Um, so, uh, right. So, um, yeah. So the Tw second twin doesn't live in an inertial reference frame relative to the first twin because they accelerate at some point. Uh, they don't have a constant velocity. They change velocities at some point. Um, and uh, this is actually the key. So uh, space and time are fake. They're relative. Um, uh, space and time are fake. They're relative. Velocity is fake. That's relative. Um, but uh, acceleration is not relative. Um, why we could talk philosophy. Um, I think we'll get to this at some point if I haven't mentioned something about it already. Um, but uh, acceleration is not relative. Um, we all have to agree on acceleration. If something's accelerating, we have to agree on it. Um, you can think of Newton's laws, F equals MA. If it's accelerating, it's feeling a force. I um, mean, everyone has to agree if something's feeling a force or not. Um, you know, like the, the squishing of the barn by length contraction, there's no force going on there. It's just space looks smaller, uh, or it's, you know, space is smaller by your measurements if you want to think about it that way. But if you always just think of proper distance and proper time, then you know it's not it's not really an issue. But anyway, so the um because what does that mean for space to contract? Okay, anyway. Um right. But if something's feeling if something's accelerating and feeling a force, we all have to agree on that. But right, like the uh whether you're if you're looking at me sitting in this chair on Earth, whether you're moving at point nine speed of light or you're just hovering in orbit above the Earth stationary, like geosynchronous or orbit or whatever above me. Um, both of those observers have to agree on like my weights by gravity on Earth. Otherwise, like, uh, you know, how I lift this pen is all different than stuff. It can't possibly work. Um, we have to agree on forces. Uh, so we have to agree on acceleration if you want, if that, you want to use that chain of reasoning. Um, but yeah, the punchline is you, you have to agree on acceleration. So I, uh, I lied when I said that twin two can pretend like twin one is always moving, is the one always moving um, because twin two is doing an acceleration. Twin two gets back and says, oh, I'm younger. And twin one is saying, i oh, sorry, uh, twin one is saying, I'm older now. And twin two comes back and says, I'm older now. Um, but twin one is like, no, you're not. We both know you were the one accelerating. You felt that acceleration when you, when you switched directions on Mars and when you took off from Earth and when you slowed down just now on Earth, you felt that force. And I saw you feel that force. We both know you were accelerating and I was not accelerating. This, this is not a symmetric situation. Don't play. So then, okay. So um, it wasn't a symmetric situation, um, but okay. So it's not symmetric. So that means that one should be older than the other. One was definitely right, but why should it be twin two? Um, just because you accelerate, why does that mean that you're the one that experiences uh, more time dilation, right? So twin two will be younger. Twin two will be younger. So why? Why did why was twin two younger? Um, even though for most of their journey, they're just. Uh, the, 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 Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. So, um, right. So the, uh, it turns out that the, um, 
the constant velocity part of the journey uh, is not a problem. Uh, it's the acceleration portion. Uh, when they're accelerating, um, if you want, you can think of it. You can think of it as when they're accelerating, they're moving faster than when they're moving at a constant velocity. Uh, and then that's where the extra time is made up. So let me draw you a picture. Okay. So uh, let's take a picture. Okay. So you space time environment. Um, get a causality grid because why not? Cool. Um, let's do uh, a constant world line. So constants, constants world line. Um, and I'm gonna say twin one is the name of it. Uh, zero speed. Um, and then let's just have, put it at the origin to make our lives easy. Uh, what did I do? Oh, okay, I still haven't made it so you can have zero speed yet. It tries to divide by zero. Okay, um, so there's twin one. Um, okay, my hacky little way of moving the label around. Okay, so uh, let's get uh, twin two. So constant world line, um, and this is going to be uh, twin two part one. Twin two part one, um, and they're going to start at zero zero because you know start at the same point that uh, you know they they agreed like oh bye see you uh, see you later on your journey I um, hope you get back before I die because you're going to age slower um, and then they're moving at I don't know point five the speed of light whatever okay there's twin two and let me make a different color just to okay so uh, twin two part one and there we go. Okay, twin two part one. Okay, um, great. And now let's do twin two part two. Twin two part two, the return journey. What did I delete over here? Uh, bracket. I lost the bracket. I think, or I just messed up everything. <laughs> oh yeah, I lost the bracket. Okay, uh, and twin two journey part two. Um, and this one's going to be negative 0.8. And what is this point? Like one comma or one, one comma 1.2 or something. Yeah, good enough. Okay. Um, let's move down. Uh, actually, you know what? As long as it intersects, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if they're going the same speed when they're going away and going. Back. That's not the point. Yeah, this diagram, as far as you know, um, is exactly what I was explaining. I didn't give any definite velocities, or if I did, there's incidental. Okay, great. So uh, yeah, twin one stationary on the Earth. Twin two is you know from this reference frame anyway. Twin two is twin two is flying over here and then bounces back. Okay. Um, so uh, right. So the let me go back to the barn ladder to show you how the simultaneity line works. Um, so, so here's the simultaneity line of the farmer. Um, as you make the farmer be the one, so when the barn is relatively moving, the farmer is also relatively moving. Okay, so um, the, far, the farmer and the barn are attached. So um, as the farmer slash barn starts to go in this direction, his simultaneity line tilts up towards the barn like this. So we've seen this before. Um, and this is, so, so first off, this is fake because so, simultaneity doesn't exist. Um, so I, maybe I don't even have to justify this. Um, but let's justify why people feel like simultaneity should work this way. Um, it's because they want to feel like space and time are perpendicular. Um, so, and that's, and it's perpendicular in this Minkowski sense. Um, so, I mean, why do you want to feel like space and time are perpendicular? Um, because it feels like you can, you can put things in space and they stay there and you, and everything is moving through time anyway. Um, Right, so the uh, so that's why we feel like space and time are perpendicular, and we like to insist on it. Um, so uh, yeah, so time moves along their uh, it moves along this this barn line, and then space uh, comes up to meet it like this. Okay, cool. So what's going to happen here? Uh, it'd be hard to draw. Um, I guess I could. 
let's let's I'll draw them if you need me to. Um, so uh, no shame if you need me to. That's fine. I'm supposed to be teaching. Um, so uh, let's draw the simultaneity lines here. So if this one was was straight up and down, the simultaneity line would be horizontal. But as twin one accelerated to this this diagonal line, their simultaneity line got tilted up. So the simultaneity line would look something like this. Let me let me draw the simultaneity. Let me draw an approximation of the simultaneity line. No, I, I take it back. I can draw the simultaneity line exactly. I can do it. Um, sim line one and you know, zero, zero. And it's going to be, this actually shouldn't be that bad, right? It should be this, you know? It should be 1.4, right? It should be 1.8, you know? It should be 1.2, it's 1.2. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It should be negative 1.2. Nope, it should be positive 1.2. Yeah, I'm happy with that. Let's make another. What's going on? Uh, yeah, bear with me for just a second. Okay, so let's look at the first part of this journey. First part of the journey, here is the velocity, and here are the simultaneity lines at each point of the journey. Constant velocity, constant slope of the simultaneity lines. The simultaneity line slope offsets the slope of the velocity. So if twin two insists on simultaneity, these are the simultaneity lines. Okay. Um, now we can draw them for uh, the second part of the journey. And for the second part of the journey, um, they will be, these will be negative 1.2 and we'll start them up here at like 1.3 and 1.3. See what it looks like. Oops. Or oh, how about just that? How about at 1.1? Such a headache. The final form of this, you'll be able to slide everything. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, that does it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we're on to something. Too far. Okay. Great, and and one more of these. Cool. Weird. Let's evenly space them like I did before. Oh, they are evenly spaced. That's weird. Yeah, okay. So um, yeah, so here's the simultaneity lines in the first part of the journey. And here are the simultaneity lines in the second part of the journey, I think. Um, yeah, I just need to put them closer together so that uh, we can, they're useful. Uh, I mean, simultaneity lines are, are infinitely abundant. Uh, it's just, you know, which ones I want to draw. Okay, it's so a little closer. Final correction. Then uh, <laughs> what I'm doing now is entirely non-physical. It's um, it's just, just diagrammatic. Okay, cool. So uh, first part of the journey, these are your simultaneity lines by the the second twin's perspective. Second part of the journey, these are the simultaneity lines. So if the second uh, twin insists on simultaneity, then what they'll see is that um, there these parts of the of the twin's journey intersect. Uh, these parts of the first of the, the station, the other twins uh, journey. Um, this point in time corresponds to this point on uh, their space flight. Um, and this point in space flight corresponds to this point in time. Um, so what happened? So from the first twins perspective, you know, assuming that the first twin calculates the time dilation of the second twin properly, they see, oh, okay, well, only three ticks have passed on my clock, but they're already halfway to Mars. Um, so time is like here about when they get to Mars. Uh, and then the next instant on their way back, you know, all this time has passed, so nothing happened. And then, and then the twin is all, is all of a sudden on their way back to Earth. Uh, how did that happen? And from the, twi the second twin's perspective, oh, wow, time is going pretty slow for uh, twin one back home. And then bam, all this time just disappeared. Oh, sorry, time is moving very fast for twin one back home. No. Nope. 
Jeez, I don't know. Okay. The um, time is moving in a way that we can line up. Like that point goes to that point. Okay, great. Um, and then this huge gap happened. Okay. The gap is, is definitely, it's definitely not real, right? There's no discontinuity. Uh, that's not true. We, we like, we like to think there's no discontinuities in physics, but there are um, on the quantum level, there are because quantum. And then uh, also just in the normal world, like the obvious Stokes equations for fluids, for example, are these nice smooth, um, you know, you feel like it's gonna be nice smooth waves and stuff. Um, and some solutions are, but shocks can occur, which are discontinuities. You can start with smooth initial conditions, evolve things through the Navier-Stokes equations, and then you get a shock. This happens in PDEs all the time. Um, so discontinuities do exist in physics, which sucks. Um, I always like to think of the world as nice and smooth and continuous, but I'm definitely gonna have to break that intuition at some point when I study like quantum like field theory or whatever at some point. Um, so, Okay, so but let's 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 be smooth. Okay, so um, say instead of a, a an instantaneous acceleration here, it was um, it was a, a, a curve here. So this is rounded. So they um, so they sped up and then they turned around in some finite amount of time, non, some non-zero amount of time, uh, and then over here they slowed down again. So when they're turning around here, you would see a fan of causality lines. Um, sticking out from here, and that would uh, take up all of this uh, twin's uh, life. This is just another reason why simultaneity is so dumb. If simultaneity is a thing in the way that we want to think of it as a thing, then this is what happens from the second twin's perspective. Oh, I'm moving along, time, you know, I'm the one moving, uh, so time is ticking slow for, for my other twin at home. Uh, that, okay, cool. Um, and now I'm going to turn around, and as I'm turning around, the first twin's entire life happens and then time you know is ticking just a little bit dilated on the way back home like like what like that is as weird as it sounds right it, it's just it's just a ridiculous consequence of these simultaneity lines and you can this this is here this is the proof that that is a consequence of thinking about simultaneity lines in such a way that when you turn around it, this this it, the simultaneity lines fan out and you know the farther away you are the more ridiculous it seems um okay questions <laughs> Okay, so Roger Penrose has something called the, um, the uh, he's a mathematician, but he just won the Nobel Prize in physics. Um, he's, uh, I, I think he's probably like the, like the smartest mathematician on the planet, but I, I, I okay, that's a dumb, I take that back. How, how can I say that? Like maybe there's people that are doing group theory things that are just like insanely hard, but Roger Penrose is just like, like an ungodly genius. He's 89, he's been, he's been around since like black holes first started to be investigated mathematically. He won the Nobel Prize because he he basically did the he did like the, the, the important like work up the math for proving that black holes like are a thing that can actually happen. Okay, brief history lesson. Einstein uh, created the general theory of relativity. It was confirmed uh, looking at an eclipse. Um, that was only recently though. <laughs> um, so the uh, recently ish. But anyway, uh, looking at an eclipse, seeing the light from the sun bend around the moon. Okay. Um, so Einstein created the general theory of relativity and a mathematical artifact of it was that uh, a singularity should, should, have, should occur when there's too much mass in one place. It'll collapse down into this infinite curvature like points, which is the center of something that should be called, or that, that is later called a black hole. Uh, has an event horizon, which, which just means like it's some surface where the curvature of space time is so intense, or you could just think of it as the gravitational pull is so intense and not even light can escape. Um, and Einstein was like, that's ridiculous. It, this is just math. That's definitely not how the world works. Um, okay, so just because it is a uh, solution of Einstein's field equations doesn't mean it could actually ever occur in reality, okay? Uh, let alone other forces of physics coming into, into play, okay. Next step of the math, Roger Penrose proves that um, the uh, that that black hole solution can be gotten from a non-black hole solution. You can start with a with this collection of mass and then evolve the equations, and it turns into the black hole. So I said, oh, actually, Einstein. Um, I mean, if you you can start with like normal like mass, no singularities or anything, and then it will evolve into the singularity. Okay, that gives us that gives us reason to investigate this further because if that's so ridiculous, we need to know what happens. Okay, then fast forward with astronomy and stuff. And uh, and we took a picture of M87 last year. Um, and then, uh, so now we've actually seen a black hole. So now finally, um, uh, Roger Penrose uh, gets the Nobel prize for proving this thing about black holes. He didn't get it until now because we didn't prove that black holes actually exist. Um, so it could have just been a mathematical curiosity up until now. 
Einstein didn't win the Nobel Prize for general relativity. They didn't prove it in his lifetime, I don't think. Um, he won the Nobel Prize for the photoelectric effect, which is actually the foundation of quantum mechanics, which he hated. He said, God doesn't play dice. He, liked, he, doesn't, he didn't like to think there was random things. Like Einstein didn't actually win the Nobel Prize for E equals MC squared or any of that stuff. But um, anyway, so Roger Penrose gets a Nobel Prize for black holes because they exist now. Um, they exist now for sure. Cool. Anyway, Roger Penrose, very, very smart mathematician. Um, and he came up with something called the Andromeda Paradox to try to destroy this notion of simultaneity. So Roger Penrose's um, idea is he's saying, all right, two people are walking down the street, one mile, or four miles per hour, three miles per hour, a, a, a brisk walk, okay? They're walking opposite directions and they pass each other. They're moving at a small velocity, but, but, but a velocity and those velocities have opposite signs. They're in opposite directions. So just like this line and this line, they're going to be crossing. They're going to be going opposite directions like this. Um, and they're going to be much, much uh, uh, steeper than these lines because they correspond to much smaller velocities, but they're crossing nonetheless. And as we see here, as you go farther and farther away from that crossing point, the simultaneity lines diverge farther and farther. The farther you go in space, those two simultaneity lines, no matter how much they're different, will be arbitrarily spaced apart later in space, okay? So um, he said, all right, so that means that you're looking at Andromeda, the nearest galaxy, um, besides the Milky Way uh, that, we, that we're in, um, and these two people walking at three miles per hour in different directions, their simultaneity lines would be tilted in different ways. And when you extrapolate those, all the, the, you know, the tons and tons of light years over to Andromeda, you would see a difference of thousands and thousands of years of time passing on Andromeda. One person would say, like, let's say, uh, he likes to say, like, um, there's aliens in Andromeda that are planning an invasion. So one of the observers would say, oh yeah, the the uh, aliens are on their way. But the person walking the other direction would be like, oh, they're still in the planning phase. They haven't actually even sent the, they haven't even, you know, dispatched the the space fleet yet to attack us. Radically different thing, hundreds of years apart or whatever. Um, and uh, the um, right. So so observer one would say, right now space fleet is on its way on Andromeda. Observer two would say, oh, they're still sitting around at the desk deciding if they should invade Earth. Um, while observer three sitting in a building watching these two pass each other contemplating physics says, those two are at that, at that spot right now. <laughs> so um, so you, you could think of it already as absurd that these two people can have insanely different ideas about what's going on right now but I think really the, the crux of the proof, you don't even need to extrapolate these lines so far out to prove the point. Extrapolating them out at all is a problem. What, like, how can you have a simultaneity X? How can you have two simultaneity lines crossed? This guy is saying all this stuff is simultaneous. This guy is saying all this stuff is simultaneous, but they occur here at the same point, which would have to be a simultaneous thing, right? If the two world lines or the two, the two lines intersect, that's gotta be a simultaneous thing. So you have this simultaneity X and nothing makes any sense. Um, so, um, yeah, yeah, that's the Andromeda paradox. Uh, the simultaneity X argument, I think I need to refine a little bit, but the Roger Penrose's point is that um, like if you're looking in retrospect, so these two people, they meet up later in life and they're talking about that, you know, that, that you know that uh, crazy day they passed each other on the street um and you know one of them reflects back and says oh yeah i remember when i first saw you passing on the street that's right when uh, andromeda um had just launched their invasion um and the other guy said the no when we passed on the street andromeda was still hundreds of years before they even thought about sending an invasion to fleet atlas what, what what are you talking about that's what i saw and that's just like ridiculous does it, it doesn't mean anymore like it's it's just a hyperbolic example that Roger Penrose came up with to, to destroy this idea of simultaneity. Okay, it's fake, it doesn't exist. Oh, okay, um, how do we feel? I'll take it as okay. Okay, um, I was gonna start talking about four momentum today, but we're already past seven. Uh, and I think that's something to save for another time, but I do have one more note to say about this to prime you for, for four momentum. What's four momentum? It's the, it's the four dimensional, uh, or it's the space time generalization of, uh, of momentum. So we're doing everything in one, one space time. Um, not everything, but we're doing things in one, one space time. Um, 
so uh right so it's just that uh so the way so instead of calling it a four momentum you call it a two momentum if you want i guess that just people call it a four momentum because momentum is usually a three vector it's three components of your momentum like xyz scale by mass um four momentum is to reconcile momentum with this idea that space and time flow into each other you can't just talk about so if velocity is relative and momentum is mass times velocity momentum has to be relative uh well i don't know if we like that if momentum is relative by the same logic energy is relative can energy be relative i feel like that's going to run us into trouble somewhere well just like how space contraction and time contraction um trade off with each other um or cancel each other out Momentum and energy have uh, are the components of a four vector, an energy momentum vector thing, and they work together in a certain way. It's 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 complicated. We but we're gonna try to make it not complicated. Um, so uh, that's for next time. That's just a little idea of what's going on. Um, moment by by saying velocity is relative, we've also made momentum and energy relative. Ah, headache. Okay. Well, we need something to work. Um, we need some version of conservation of energy. So um, we, we need to think about these things differently. And it actually is pretty cool how that, how that plays out because energy and momentum end up in the same kind of vector together. Um, they're like the same kind of thing. You think of space and time so separately, but space usually, but special relativity thinks of space and time as, oh, they're just, I mean, there's two dimensions. Um, they're, they're, uh, there's this weird inner product that treats one different than the other, but you can flow in from one to another. Um, you can think of your direction through space-time, not just your direction through space. So in a similar way, you can have momentum and an energy through space-time. Okay, that's that. I didn't I didn't tell you any math. I just told you um, ideas. So <laughs> we'll do math next time. Um, okay. So to get ready for that, though, um, I have to point out something that we've been lying about in these diagrams. So I tried to make this course for lin just linear algebra. So I gloss over detail. I gloss over details. I try to I say accurate, but at the expense of the accuracy and at the expense of only doing this with linear algebra, there are certain things that I cannot show you on these diagrams. So what if I drew a curve on this diagram and I wanted to show the sim uh, uh, I wanted to show, okay, so on these diagrams, what I do is I show you how things look from different reference frames. So let's say I wanted to move this whole diagram into the reference frame of the travel of, the, of twin two. Well, if I wanted to move all of this into the reference frame of twin two, First, we'd have to pick which velocity I'm going to move it to. I could move it to this velocity or I can move it to this velocity. But then it would only be accurate for half the journey. And then what if the twin was moving on some curve where they, through a, a curves world line, so their velocity is varying continuously. Then the Lorentz boost that we need is going to have to change continuously. Um, you could do a, like a continuous morphing of this thing and then the simultaneity lines will all overlap and it'll be a wreck. Um, but the thing is that that's not even a, a valid thing to do anymore because this entire time I've been conflating the tangent space with the actual manifold. Or if you want, um, no, I think that's the, that's the way to say it. If we're going to do real math, I've got to say it. Okay, so space time is a manifold. Um, velocities live in tangent spaces that are little, you know, little tangent spaces at each point. Um, so what we do in the barn ladder paradox is we use the we use the local the like the local trivialization of this manifold we just say like oh the metric is the same everywhere um the velocity is the same everywhere so you know it's fine you don't need to define um a smooth section of the tangent bundle or anything like that let's just use the local trivialization and go over to this um so local trivialization i mean what i mean by that is just pretend that the whole tangent bundle is one connected vector space uh, or a dimension itself, and then you just draw a diagram like this. Um, it only works if your velocity is constant. If your velocity is constant, so when you make a statement about time dilation and space contraction, you're saying that moving at this velocity, those effects will happen. So that's a statement on the tangent space. Um, the reason I can draw these kind of diagrams that have to do with the manifold, with the lengths and the positions of things in actual space, is because they're moving with that uh, with that tangent space property everywhere for their entire life. So then, when I draw, so okay, so when I draw that um, this this ladder is length contracted. Um, what I mean by that here is that so here's the ladder in its natural state. 
this point and this point undergo the same transformation for the entire lifespan and then the length uh, we see macroscopically here. Um, the real statement of length contraction and time dilation is an infinitesimal one. Um, and if you try to make a twin pair in a twin par paradox, or if you have like a curved world line, um, you would have to constantly change everything as you shift your perspective along that world line. So the whole of reality would be undergoing different space and time contractions uh, as you continuously change your velocity to keep up with that world line. So here we get away with drawing a diagram like this because all the velocities are constant. Here, not so much. Here, um, it becomes clear that uh, if you really want to talk about how everything looks along a world line, that's a constantly changing thing. So it's, it's not impossible. I just need to put a slider. Um, but it's, it's, it exposes something that I kind of got away with here. Uh, here, you know, I said, oh, look at this slope here. Um, this is like the length. This is the velocity. It's, the, it's not. Velocities exist on these little, you know, these little spaces that attach to every point of our space time. Um, but then they stretch out over the actual space because things flat. Does that make sense? Oh, good, great. Ah, yes, math students. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, so four momentums for next time, a primer on how I've been lying to you so far. So that's not a problem when we talk about four momentum. Uh, and then uh, the, 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 the tangent bundle. Uh, oh, and, okay, right, right. The last thing I wanted to mention, while we're on manifolds, um, the metric is a, the metric on space-time is a smooth section of the second exterior product of the cotangent bundle. That's just what a metric is. I'm probably already know that. The um, if you already if you know what I'm talking about with the tangent bundle. Um, so it's a two form. Uh, in flat space-time, that two form is constant over all of space. So um, again, when I'm going to measure lengths and stuff, you know, in 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 differential geometry, this is a massive headache. To I think it's a massive headache to um to measure anything when the when the metric is changing point to point because you have to do like parallel transport and stuff like that. Um, here, you don't have to do any of that. The metric is the same everywhere. So we can naively, we can do the naive thing, which is just say like, oh, everyone agrees on how to measure distance. It's a space-time interval. Let's just like do that everywhere. Um, and again, this is for linear algebra, so it all collapses down. Um, but but so there's something fundamental here is that, um, you can get away with explaining all the special relativity properties without ever talking about manifolds because space time is flat. So general relativity, space time is curved, which just means, with, okay, geometry, curvature, metric, two form, all the same thing. These are all the same thing. When I say like curvature, geometry, it's just another way to say the metric. You don't have to actually think of it as curvature if you don't want to. The, the curvature of general relativity, that picture you see of like the earth sitting on a grid and it bends warps space time, that's just an analogy to how curvature works in three dimensions um, and two dimensions. That's just an analogy. So when I say curvature, I really am just talking about this metric tensor. Um, in flat space time, in just in space time, no general relativity, that metric tensor is the same everywhere. So you don't need a manifold, you don't need a tangent bundle, you don't need a cotangent bundle. You can just say this is the metric on the whole space. That's fine. Um, your space contraction and light contraction change based off of the relative velocity you're viewing at, but the metric is invariant. The metric doesn't care. The metric is invariant to velocity, invariant to time, invariant to space. Uh, yeah, it's invariant to the manifold and it's invariant to the tangent bundle. It's fantastic. It's, it's, I, I, I kind of, it, it's, you kind of think of it as the, the thing that motivates all of it. Um, something that's actually invariant, that's not fake. Um, yeah, so that's why this class is special relativity for mathematicians through linear algebra is because you don't, actually have to talk about manifolds because the metric tensor is constant over the entire manifold. That being said, if you want to understand general relativity, you definitely have to move up into the into the harder formalism of manifolds. So, I mean, that's why I wanted to mention it now is uh, in lesson six, when we talk about general relativity, that's a, if that's something you want to study later, um, you're going to have to generalize your understanding. So I thought I'd like plant the little seeds along the way. Um, but it's really, in, I think it's really interesting that special relativity is a linear algebra discipline. It's, um, it's, all, just, it's all just a linear algebra argument um, since the metric tensor is a uh, constant. When the metric tensor is constant, that's just like, you know, math 405, which is some upper level linear algebra class that you talk about distances and norms and quadratic forms and stuff like that. So yeah, or, or it's a pseudometric really, but I mean, cool. Okay, <sighs> that's all I wanted to say for today. Uh, any questions before we uh, depart?
thank you guys for listening. I appreciate it. And I'll see you in three weeks, hopefully with a virtual reality simulation. Uh, <laughs> that'd be great. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. This is an amazing lecture. <laughs> ah, thanks. <laughs> appreciate it. I'm going to stop the recording. Um, but yeah, no, feel free.